The late W. A. W. Tozer, in his classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy, wrote these words. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That was the way he opened a classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or whether you're here today simply curious about faith, all of us could more or less agree with this premise, that the way you view God will affect the way you pray, and it will affect even your readiness or desire to pray. For example, if you perceive God to be distant and indifferent, you may conclude that it's futile to pray. Or if you view God as a tyrant, you may choose to keep your distance rather than daring to draw near to him. On the other hand, if you see clearly his majesty and his beauty displayed in the work of Jesus, well, (laughs) the way you see God is going to affect the way you pray. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians 1. If you have a uh, smartphone with a Bible app on it, you could turn to 2 Corinthians 1. Just turn the ringer down on your phone. This passage is also going to be on the screen, and a part of this passage is on the back of the bulletin this morning. We're looking at 2 Corinthians 1, specifically at verses 3 to 11, and this is what we read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort also. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril And he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. This is the second and final week of just a short two-week teaching series that we're doing that we're titling Prayer First, and there are two reasons why this particular passage in 2 Corinthians 1 um, is especially significant to me personally. First, it's a passage that's reminded me that seeing God through a biblically informed lens rather than simply a caricature, but to see God through a biblically informed lens ignites desire in me to approach him. Because the God who's revealed in this book, while there's much about him that is mysterious, and while um, I I don't pretend to understand all of the, the details of his sovereignty, what I see in the Bible about God is that he is beautiful. And that he is compelling. And second... When you get down to verses 10 to 11, 
those verses have significantly shaped in me a commitment toward corporate prayer or what we might call the practice of praying together with others who know God and who love Him. This passage opens with a beautiful reference to God in verse 3. It's, it refers to God this way as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Now, in a, in a room this size, with a group this size, perhaps there are people who came in today and honestly, you're weary. It's that cumulative exhaustion. You're just worn out. And you're hurting. It's possible that people like that came into this place today and you desire comfort. To people who might have come in today not really knowing where you stand with Jesus, not really sure that you've ever made a decisive commitment to God, we want you to know we are so glad that you're here. You are always welcome at Lakeside. This is a place where you can bring your curiosities and this is a place where you can investigate honestly the claims of Christ in the company of people who would love to come alongside you in that journey. It's also likely that there are a number of people who came into this place today, you're followers of Jesus. You've trusted Him and you followed Him and today, as you've come in, you're aware of the fact that, uh, well, you're spiritually a little bit off balance. You're feeling spiritually a little off the rails. And we're glad you're here today. You didn't put this off. You kept the sacred appointment with God, and you came to gather with others in corporate worship. At Lakeside, we believe that God's Spirit is really here with us this morning. Amen. He's in this place with us right now. And he really cares. God is referred to as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. At one point in the Apostle Paul's life as a Christian leader, the conflict he encountered got so heavy, he wasn't sure if he, is in, he and his companions were going to make it. He alludes to that in verse 8. He says, For we did not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Listen to this. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. We're not given uh, details as to the specifics of this difficulty that Paul faced. We only know it was weighty and evidently serious. But here's what's riveting. When the Apostle Paul was at his lowest point, he discovered that God's comfort was sufficient to get him through. That's no little deal. He discovered God's comfort was enough to get him through. Now, what exactly is comfort? Because as we read through this passage, you couldn't help but notice, right, that in verses 3 to 7, some form of that word comfort appeared 10 times. In the book of 2 Corinthians, it appears 29 times. Some form of that word comfort. Normally, when we think of comfort, we think of something soothing, right? Like a gentle back rub. Or a cool breeze during July along the shores of Lake Michigan. Or a latte at Cafe Talaza. <laughs> or a discount double check by Aaron Rodgers after another <laughs> Packers touchdown. You know, something soothing. Something really soothing. But friends, listen to me. But that's not what Paul had in mind when he spoke of comfort here. I have a friend named Brian Wilkerson who's a pastor in the Boston area. And in commenting on this passage we're considering today, Brian writes this. The word comfort in the Bible 
has more to do with strengthening than soothing. In other words, comfort does not simply relieve our pain, it stiffens our resolve. God is a comforter. The Greek word that's translated comfort literally means to help by giving courage. And interestingly, the the etymology of our English word comfort points us in that direction as well. Check this out. Comfort comes from the Latin root fortis, which means strength. It shows up in words like fortress and fortitude. Comfort. So comfort, friends, isn't simply about feeling better. It's about feeling stronger. Now, now think about this. Isn't strength what we really need when we're facing adversity? You need the strength to get through it. Sturdy and lasting comfort isn't found in a down quilt or a shot of brandy or in a bowl of chicken soup. Those things might be soothing for a moment, but they're not ultimately going to help you get through whatever it is that you're facing. When you're hurting, it's especially meaningful to have someone come alongside you in order to share a measure of strength with you. Paul refers to God as the Father of mercies and the God of all. Come forth, for teeth, strength. God is a God who offers strength in our weakness. In fact, God can turn an experience of distress into a platform for the display of his comfort. The display of his strength. In Paul's crisis, God came alongside him. We're not told how. We're only told that God did. God shared his strength with Paul, and Paul got through the crisis. Friends, I I just hope we can mark this down this morning. God loves to share his strength with us when we humbly look in his direction, when we acknowledge our weakness and we look hard in his direction. Many years ago, I had a meeting in my office. This goes back two decades. I had a meeting in my office with um, a mom, mom of a teenage daughter who was in a very open rebellion. And uh, the rebellion had actually reached a point where uh, there was a defiance that was dangerous. Um, And this mom was in great distress and and contacted me and said, Tim, can I see you? I said, absolutely. She came in. And when she walked into my office, it was like a mantra on her lips. I need to be strong through this. I need to be strong through this. I need to be strong through this. Over and over, she repeated that. I just, you know, you know let's, let's visit. Let me hear your heart. Let's interact about what's going on. And she shared the story. And she would begin to, uh, her lower lip would begin to quiver. And she'd sob. And then she'd say, I need to be strong through this. I need to be strong through this. We had visited for some time. And there was a pause, and I said to her, precious sister in Christ, I said, friend, is it possible that God is inviting you to acknowledge your weakness and to look to him for his strength so that you don't have to be strong through this? you could humbly admit your weakness. And her physical response, the posture was, oh, 
Yes, that'd be so. That would be so wonderful. And she did. And years later, her daughter is doing very well walking with Jesus. And this mom moved through an experience where she learned something very, very valuable. She didn't have to be personally, in and of herself, strong through this. She could admit her weakness and receive from God his sufficient strength. We might call it his comfort, his fortis. As God meets with us in our weakness, a really curious thing happens then. We become better equipped to meaningfully make a difference in the lives of others who are in need of comfort. Think again about what Paul said in verses 3 and 4. He said, uh, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now listen to this. Who comforts us in all of our distress and gives to us an ability then to comfort others also who are going through a similar distress. What Paul is really saying is, live with an open hand. By the way, I think this is real consistent with uh, the early pages of the Bible in Genesis 12, where God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. Made that covenant with Abraham, you're blessed to be a blessing. Live with an open hand. Receive from God all that he wants to give to you. He's a generous God, and he wants to generously give to us. And then with that same open hand, rather than clutching at it, leave your hand open and share it and give it away. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. With the comfort you yourself receive, share it and give it away. Because you see, can we just mark this down? God wants to redeem our sorrow. As I said a little earlier, this is the second and final week of a series we've titled Prayer First. And someone might be here today privately thinking, well, what does all this have to do with prayer? It's a fair question. And I would say, it has everything to do with prayer. It has everything to do with the way you approach God. How do you see Him? Is it through a caricature? Maybe a caricature that reflects some of your own preferences? Or is it the God that's been revealed in the pages of the Bible? and in the person of Jesus. What I want us to see is that there's a connection between first our view of God and His strength and second our practice of prayer. There is a connection between the two that's healthy and dynamic and vital. We see that more clearly in verses 8 to 11. Verses 8 and 9, we read this, For we did not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely, isn't this a great line? To rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God whose strength is unlimited. Nothing is too difficult for God. All things are possible with Him. And the first thing that we see in verses 8 and 9 is our struggles help clarify for us the object of our reliance. Are you going to look beyond yourself to God or are you going to stay fixed on yourself and your own resources? Paul says in verse 9, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God. Because our resources in and of ourselves are finite and limited. God's resources are infinite. His strength is boundless. His grace is sufficient. 
Our struggles can help us get clarity about the object of our reliance. But second, when God is seen as adequate and merciful and strong, our desire to pursue Him in prayer intensifies. Look again at what He says in verses 10 and 11. He delivered us from such a deadly peril. He's talking about that situation He refers to back in verse 8. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and He will deliver us. On Him we've set our hope that He will deliver us again. Now watch verse 11. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. These two verses, verses 10 and 11, pressed into me many, many years ago a desire not only to be trying to cultivate uh, growth in my personal practice of prayer as a part of my relationship with, with God, but it also pressed into me a desire to do whatever I could to catalyze in the people around me a desire to come together shoulder to shoulder and to agree in prayer. Paul is saying that there's a relationship between God's comfort and our praying. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, verse 10. And he's also saying that one of the implications of many praying is that many are going to give thanks. You see what's going on here? Many will know the joy of participating with God in His work. We might summarize what Paul's saying in verses 10 and 11 this way. When many pray, many will give thanks. Or when many pray, many will experience the joy of God's answer. That's what happens when we pray together. So God moves in response to our agreement in prayer. I can look at Ray and say, Ray, it's amazing what God did. He gave us a piece of the action. I can look at Pam and say, Pam, isn't it amazing what God did? How he moved? We had a piece of the action. He invited us in to partner with him in his redemptive work. Lakeside listens to me. Nothing will cause joy to rise in this place like an awareness of the power and presence of God permeating this fellowship and the beautiful grace of God leaving a trail of transformation in the lives of people. When I was a boy, I'd spend a couple of delightful weeks each summer at my grandparents' cottage in Chetek, Wisconsin. They had a cottage on uh, Prairie Lake. And uh, I would always get up early in the morning because I was so excited to be there. And uh, Mimi and Papa, my grandma and grandpa, they showed me where the variety pack of Kellogg cereals was on the top of the refrigerator, and I'd grab one of those babies and uh, pour myself, pour some milk over my cereal. I'd be all alone looking out at the lake, just beside myself with anticipation to get out there that day. And occasionally, I would hear, I would hear a boat that I couldn't see because their cottage was up, on a, it was up on a hill and there was a bank that went down. And, and so I could hear a boat, but I couldn't see it. So I would run out the back door and I'd run down to the boathouse to look out to see if I could see a boat very often, the boat was already around a bend. It was probably someone fishing the shore for bass or something. I don't know. But I'd go down, and I couldn't see the boat. But here's the deal. I could see a wake. I could see a wake. Now, imagine with me what life around Lakeside would be like if you were regularly recognizing the wake of God's presence. Don't physically see him with your eyes, but you see what he's done. You can see he's passed by. 
with regularity, you see the wake of God's presence. Friends, listen to me. When many pray, many will give thanks. When many pray, many will rejoice in God's answer. So this evening, there's going to be a corporate prayer gathering here. How's that for a commercial? (laughs) It's going to be a community prayer gathering that Lakeside is hosting. It's with several other churches in Kiwani County here. There's a church in Kiwani. There are several in Algoma. And I have no idea how many people from other churches are going to be here. I look forward to meeting them. I want to affirm our partnership in the gospel, right? With those from other churches. But I think it'd be great if there was a wonderful host contingent from Lakeside here tonight. And I can tell you what we're going to do. We're going to pray through a pattern of prayer that was used by Christians in Scotland uh, over 300 years ago that preceded a time of an amazing move of God in Great Britain. And it was just really simple. There would be a focus on adoration of God, worship. There would be a focus on awakening in the church so that the church would be alive to Christ and all she could be. And there would be a focus on advance of the gospel in the world. Because my guess is in Kiwani County and up the lake shore into Door County, there are thousands of people who have yet to meet Jesus. And we're going to fight for them before God. That's what we're going to be doing tonight. And if you've never been to a corporate prayer gathering, would some of you who are in that category, would you consider coming tonight at 6.30? Just bring your curiosity. And you wouldn't have to pray out loud. You could sit in a circle with other people and you could agree in prayer as they lead out in prayer. But your participation here would be meaningful during this time tonight. I just want to close with this story. In 1857, uh, there was a crash in New York City. After a period of uh, prosperity, relatively speaking, and after a a period of uh, a lot of self-reliance, there was a crash in New York City. Banks failed. Railroads went into bankruptcy, factories were shut down, and unemployment spread like fire. And there was a, uh, a layman who was a businessman in New York City who was appointed by the Dutch Reformed Church to, uh, to go into Manhattan and to seek to be salt and light in uh, the business district of Manhattan. His name was Jeremiah Lamphere. And Lamphere uh, could see the spiritual declension that was all around him. And so what he decided to do was to invite those who would be interested to a prayer meeting in downtown New York City. He distributed a little flyer advertising a prayer meeting that would be in the consistory building of the old Dutch church beginning on Wednesdays, and it was to be once a week. And so at that very first prayer meeting that he called. This is, what, this is what's written. At 12 noon, the 23rd of September, 1857, the door opened and the faithful land fear took his seat to await the response to his invitation. Five minutes went by. No one appeared. The missionary paced the room in a conflict of fear and faith. Ten minutes elapsed. Still no one came. Fifteen minutes passed. Land fear was yet alone. 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, and then at 12.30, a step was heard on the stairs, and the first person appeared, then another, and another, and another, until six people were present, and the prayer meeting began. On the following Wednesday, there were 40 intercessors. Thus, in the first week of October, 1857, it was decided to hold a meeting daily instead of weekly. Listen to this, everyone. I mean, this is history. Within six months, 
10,000 businessmen were gathering daily for prayer in New York City, and within two years, a million converts were added to the American churches. Undoubtedly, the greatest revival in New York's colorful history was sweeping the city, and it was of such an order to make the whole nation curious. Now listen to this. This, this, this hits me. There was no f- fanaticism, no hysteria, simply an incredible movement of the people to pray. I just want to say this morning, I live with this longing that God would do it again. Many of you know I'm from Door County. I love the Lake Shore. I love this region. I love this region and the people who live here. I've got high school friends who I love who as of today still have never been introduced to Jesus, never bowed the knee. And I don't want to just shrug my shoulders and say, oh, wow. Because they matter to God. I want to fight for them. And I would love to fight for them and for your friends and for your sons and daughters who right now are prodigal and wayward. I want to fight for the people in your circle of influence. You want to see, come to Christ, get established in faith, be equipped and deployed. We got a shot tonight to do it together. Father in heaven, Lord, I just thank you for the presence of your spirit. God, I thank you for the respectful, good attention that the people in this room have given to your word. God, I pray that your spirit would do what only your spirit could do right now and seed something in them for your glory, for our good, and for the joy of a whole lot of people along the lakeshore. In Jesus' name.